I'm with David McGee, and we're talking about humour in marketing and communications. You're going to hear a little bit about David uh, in his uh, eclectic background uh, in just a moment. Uh, it should be quite an interesting uh, conversation, this one, because, you know, I think as, as we've um, sort of been discussing before we pressed record, um, a little while ago, and we were talking about whether it's a thing, whether we should, whether we could. Um, and I really want to explore with David, who has given quite a bit of thought on this subject, um, really the, the concept or the question which I have, because a lot of the textbooks um, traditionally have said keep humour out of it because it's too subjective. It's um, Yes, it might have a few little upsides, but it's too high risk. Now, I want to challenge that in this conversation because I don't actually fully believe that. I think if you really know your audience, there is a place for it. But I really want to hear what David thinks on this one, because he's given this a lot more thought than I have. Um, so we're going to go there and uh, have a little bit of a conversation around that. But for those of um, the people listening here, David, um, who don't know you, could you give a little bit of a backstory? Who is David McGee? Yeah. Uh, well, I am a lecturer at a university in England, in the UK, Birmingham City University, have been for five and a half years now. Prior to that, I had an eclectic background. I was primarily in media uh, and communication, uh, working backwards uh, from my time at ECU, Birmingham City University. I, I went back to university, did an MBA at the rival university across town, University of Birmingham. Uh, out came out of my MBA, had an idea for a startup, um, got very much involved in the entrepreneurial scene in Birmingham, quite active entrepreneurial scene. Um, we ran out of cash. We developed some really interesting technology, but we ran out of cash in the field of antique counterfeiting technology. Um, going back further into my uh, history, um, prior to my MBA, I worked out in uh, Afghanistan with the uh, with NATO, uh, working in what's rather sh spookily called psyops, but fundamentally it's about influence. It's about trying to communicate pe to people, uh, please don't do this, or please encourage people to to or the population of the target audience to do something. Primarily in Afghanistan, kinetic environment. Um, please stop shooting at us. Um, was pr the principal message, so uh, not very effective, uh, to be perfectly frank with you. Uh, did that for four years in Afghanistan, loved it, worked a lot with the Americans, um, got a huge amount of American friends, especially in, in Los Angeles, on, on both coasts actually. Uh, great, great fun, the Americans were putting a lot of resources into that. Prior to that, I was working, prior to Afghanistan, I worked in the uh, journal, field of journalism uh, for BBC as a TV reporter. Uh, and then prior to that, worked on uh, Fleet Street, uh, the, the hub of British national newspapers for about eight, nine years or so. Um, and prior to that, um, did a bit of traveling, did my, MBA, uh, my undergrad. So in a nutshell, uh, communication, uh, moving out of journalism uh, into the uh, influencer space, psychological operations for the military, and then came out of that, did, I went back to academia, uh, which is where I ended up and um, where I, I hit you now. So coming back, if I, it might be useful to talk about why am I talking about humor? I'm not a comedian. I can't tell a joke for love and the money. Um, my, my, my timing is terrible. Um, however, I agree with Neil that there's a lot of mileage, which I think is currently not treading on the use of humor. Um, and I think maybe it's an opportunity to kind of give you, uh, where did I get this idea from? It. I am doing a PhD on the use of humor and communication effects. So can we, question mark, use humor to better improve our the effectiveness of our communication? That's a question. That's the purpose of my PhD. Open mind. I believe, my thesis is, um, this way, I believe so. So I'm testing a thesis in my PhD. 
which says that humor could be used. And I'm gonna go through a variety of, maybe we'll talk about how doing it later on. So I'm gonna try and test the effects of humor uh, on a particular uh, data set. Uh, and I believe humor is uh, an, an affective, it's an emotional effect. If you laugh, we all laugh, we generally feel positive about something, we feel emotionally attached, we feel engaged. And I think those are the qualities which any decent marketeer would be, would pay them, give their right arm for. If you can engage, if you can cut through with an audience, I think it's very, very effective. Um, I teach at the university, I teach marketing, and there was one statistic which came to me a few years ago that we, as modern day homo sapiens living in the West, we get about 10, 8, 9,000, 10,000 messages every day, hitting our eyeballs, hitting our earballs. So that could be obviously the old traditional billboards, but it was people's logos. There are, there are messages and there are logos and there's, there's so much communication hitting our eyeballs every day. How do you, I mean, on social, and that's old data, by the way, that's about six years old. So you can imagine with the proliferation of social media, that that's just increased, increased, increased. So we're getting about six, maybe possibly north of 10,000 messages. How as marketeers, as communicators, how do we cut through? That's my question. How do we do it? Um, well, go back and try, as Mr. Jobs says, don't, don't try and invent, steal, best people best inventors steal over ideas. And I've just gone back to basic Aristotelian principles. If, if you want to communicate, you can go through the heart, you go through the brain, and it all has to be from a position of trust, pathos, iphos, and logos. Written two and a half thousand years ago by Mr. Aristotle, sitting on a marble stone somewhere in, in Athens. That's what he came up. If you want to communicate, you've got to emote, You've got to attract the, 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 the logic, and it's got to be from a position of, of trust, the efforts of the individual. That's why Boris Johnson, let's, let's bring it back to the, the UK and contemporaneous, uh, contemporary uh, uh, activity. Boris Johnson today, you know, last night, dropped out of the leadership campaign. Nobody believes a word Boris Johnson says. I've got 102 people who signed for me to stand up against that. Nobody believes a word Boris Johnson says. He can be the most effective, the most emotional, logical argument, but if you don't believe the individual, it's not gonna cut through. So I took those basic Aristotelian principles and figured out how can we best, better cut through the, the miasma of, of messages we get every day. And I felt humor. Was, was was something which we could potentially I could potentially look into. Um, and where did I get this? And another way, where did I get this idea? Well, let me tell you the backstory. I was on a plane coming in from British Airways from Toulouse, um, flying to Heathrow, two and a half hour, three hour flight, and sat on, sat on the plane, sat down. We did. We we all we on hundreds of planes. We all do the same thing. We sit down and we zone out. We don't not interested in the in the in the safety message. We're interested in the duty free. We're interested in chatting away. We're just not interested. I don't. I mean, we just get the zone out. We've done it a hundred times. This time, I looked at the safety message, and this time, for the next four minutes, they had my rapt attention. I was completely drawn in to this message. And if you go online, maybe it's a link which you can put on Neil. The British Airways took a very, in my opinion, very brave decision to use humour in the safety message. Um, I won't bore you too much about what it, that they did, but basically they used humour. They got people to laugh while being told that their, uh, their, their life jacket was beneath there, to, where the exits were, where the lights on the road. I mean, all the usual message was told in this from a position of humour. And I went away and I thought about this and I actually got off the plane and my friends, I went on, we went on a hiking holiday to the Pyrenees. My friends were saying, Frank, did you see that message? I was listening and thinking, there's something in this. There's something definitely in this use of humour. Because it cut through. Cut through with me, 
it got through my 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 friends. And I thought, hey, there's, there's got to be something there. There's got to be something to be to investigate, to 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 test, to 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 try and see what the basis of this. And that was the basis. That moment when I walked off that plane in uh, in Heathrow, Heathrow, sorry. It's like, there's got to be something here. There's got something where, as professional communicators and professional marketers, we can, we should, we should be able to use marketing uh, humour in that in that process. But I just don't know how, and that's why I've been trying to investigate uh, in my PhD. Um, and yeah, I uh, I haven't got the results yet. PhD is we're at the stage of data collection. Um, if anybody's done a PhD, you'll know that there's a huge ethical issue. You've got to make sure your ethics are, are all in a, all your ducks in a row. Uh, and I'm at, just at the close of my ethics now. So over the next three to four months, I'll be collecting my data. So maybe it's an opportunity to give you my initial uh, analysis. I will be presenting it uh, at a conference in Boston next year for the International, um, International Society for Humor Studies, IS. HS, which I'm a member of. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm this, and it's great because talking purely selfishly, I get to read a lot of jokes. I get to read a lot of, you know, amusing stuff. It's actually really enjoyable. But I also get to understand the the theory of humour as well. And I've sort of, as is my nature, distilled it down to its basic principles, which I think are consistent with every humorous position, every humorous uh, scenario has, I say, at least two, two, two core characteristics. Happy to talk about that in a second. But then every humorous joke, every humorous situation that we all go has to have two elements, uh, the two fundamental elements. Without that, there is no humor. And uh, mm -hmm. we need to get to that. Yeah. fascinated by those two elements because i don't know the answer here and i'm sure everybody listening is thinking go on david tell us but we'll come we'll come on to that go i just want to take a little sort of step or two or three back to your time in afghanistan mm -hmm. not not necessarily to to go into huge mm -hmm. amounts of detail i'm sure there are things there that you obviously can't talk about for sensitivity reasons but humor in a situational scenario like that is, is there a kind of a boundary in which humour can't cross? Because obviously you were talking at, at, in a very sensitive place about hugely sensitive things. Would, would that be a step too far? No, I, I, quite the opposite. I think fundamentally, again, the fundamentals, those two elements, which I'll come on to in a second, which are, to, to, uh, cut across all, all cultures. Um, Certain cultures, you know, uh, add on a couple of add-ons, if you will. But fundamentally, if you engage with somebody, uh, they they generally tend to respond. And I should say that the Afghans, it's like saying the Afghans, it's like saying the Europeans, they're made up of four or five strong dominant, strong ethnic groups: Pashtuns, the Tajiks, the Uzbeks. Uh, Hazara. I mean, it's like saying the Spanish are the same as the English, as the Irish are the same as Romanians. It's this, they're, you know, they've been formed by very different forces. But fundamentally, the Afghans as an entity, they're, they're, they've, they've got a wonderfully playful attitude towards life. Um, they, they, they like a laugh, they're very open hearted people. Um, and playfulness is one of the elements which is required one of the fundamental in my opinion i should say i'm here to be contradicted but my fundamental elements of any humorous setting any joke has to have a degree of play instilled in, in instinctive in it and i think there's an element of that in, in the culture um there are certain things you wouldn't talk about um but then that's more common sense rather than uh than, you know, the prohibitation of humor. Well, then in some instances, it could be talked about. So I, I, I think as long as you're, you've got a common sense and you've got your head screwed on, um, a lot of communication can be used. Can, certainly in a war zone, in a kinetic zone, I think we should be using more uh, a degree of humor to cut through because 
one of the things which I found from the certainly listening to them to the Afghans um, was they just didn't believe what we said. Full stop. End of. No chance. You know they don't believe. They know we're trying to persuade them. They know that, and therefore they just switch off. Back. Not interested. It's like the 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 instincts of a party political broadcast. Somebody's trying to flog you an idea about a, a party. They just turn up. I'm not interested in that sales pitch, and that's what we failed. What we did. We failed so often in Afghanistan to try to persuade people, and they're going. Well, what about this? What about that? What about that? And you just never cut for it. And so I think on the whole, the mission was um, try to apply things. Um, I could understand why it is that the army and the NATO and the, the military is quite rigid in its thought processes and not necessarily open uh, to, 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 to different approaches. Um, and I don't necessarily think there was an awful lot of buy-in to those to that to, to, to the use of alternative ways of, 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 of developing them in the messaging. It sounds like a bit of a criticism. It is a criticism, I guess, of the um, the communication process within a, a war zone. There are, in my opinion, better ways of doing it, but we're getting off, off point about humor here. We're talking about psychological operations in a war zone. Um, the, the, there is plenty of learning which we could do if we're going to do that properly, if we're ever we're in a war zone, there's plenty of ways of doing this. Look, if you want to look at a good practice, just look at the, the Ukrainians out in, 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 in Russia. They're doing it pretty well. Um, but that's a different topic, different subject. I'm more than happy to talk about that in a separate podcast, I think. Mm. Yeah, and it's interesting because I I'm kind of trying to sort of for myself I guess sort of and on behalf of you know, people listening and watching, trying to kind of establish where and how far we can kind of push this whole idea of humour. I mean, if you're responsible, for example, for a brand, I mean, let's bring it right back to kind of commercial level rather than necessarily looking at sort of national level in in war zones, etc. Mm. At, at a commercial level. You know, we are, you know, we might have brand guidelines, for example, and the brand guidelines say kind of here's the boundary within which we're allowed to operate. So the kind of messages, the propositions, the kind of things that we'd be confident to talk about. When it comes down to something like a, a regulated industry, for example, so if you're in pharmaceuticals or the legal profession or mm. telecoms, you know, really heavily regulated industries, mm. there are kind of almost sort of compliance mm. issues here. If you step outside, and again, this is, I mean, I'm again willing to be sort of disputed here because if you step outside of the boundary of a safe kind of central point and and by that i mean you know the the rules and the the kind of terms of engagement let's call them that from a, a sort of a, a brand guideline rule book mm. if you step outside of that there's risk instantly mm. you've identified risk in in the mix here it's going to be a, a really confident or maybe foolhardy person who's going to actually take that risk, isn't it? And actually introduce this ingredient, which by its very nature, I mean, I love that first word of the two, that the playfulness, that kind of sort of, it, it's a little bit ambiguous. It's a little bit vague. It's a, it's dangerous mm. ground, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. And, 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 and I'm not here to say, and, and if it's come across as I am, I'm not here to say that humor can be applied in every communication effect. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm trying to explore is, um, and I'm in the foothills of my research here, is how do we cut through on a relatively benign uh, subject matter? It's not about funeral directors. It's not about the law. We're on a relatively benign, safe position um, how can I better, is it, well, question, is it possible to use humour? Um, yes, no. If I am going to use, if that answer to that is yes, if I am going to use humour, um, is it possible to test a humorous message against a standard message? This is actually, the, I'm giving you the methodology of my, my PhD here. Two messages, a standard message, and I've got a, the same information, but in a, 
using a, a degree of humor. Okay, so standard message telling four or five point, bullet points, exactly the same information but delivered with a degree of humor. What's how, how better is, or how worse, I don't know what the answer is because I haven't received any data yet, but how, how effective is the humorous message? If it is it effective? And that's in a fairly bland statement. Nobody's gonna, there's no regulatory issues about my, my subject matter. It's, it's about, to give you a bit of background, it's about uh, student, um, student engagement with universities. Univers in short, universities pitch every year for new students. Okay, every year, about this time of the year, there are open days up and down the country. And they're pitching for students to come and visit, uh, come and visit them, and also then hopefully sign up. I've been to student, I've been to open university, uh, open days myself. My daughter's going to university, hopefully going to university next year. I've been to uh, quite a few open days, and there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of these uh, open day messages all over the internet, and they're all the same. They're all pretty standard stuff. Is it possible to see if I can put a humorous element into that? Would it be effective in the eyes of the audience? I don't know. I guess it will be. Um, because of the, my hypothesis has been informed by my experience, the Toulouse Heathrow Airport, and all the reading which I've done in my literature review suggests strongly that humor has been used uh, very effectively uh, by the advertising industry and by the marketing industry. Um, and I just want to know, um, is it possible to you to do that within a relatively benign setting? Now, further research may say, maybe I can try and explore the parameters within the reg with regulated elite, regulation, this is the law, the, 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 the drug companies and all that. Perfectly reasonable. Instinctively, Neil, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't seem to fit common sense that you could use humor to sell funeral directors something inside of me i've got no evidence to suggest it but common sense will shout out to me you can't flog a casket with a, a good joke i don't know i mean i could be wrong i, I don't know <laughs> i wish the tory party had a bit of sense of humor because if you can't honestly tell us that liz truss is going to be a great leader are you have do you have a sense of humor no no it's just going to be great nobody had a sense of humor about that and i say the same thing about other industries but what i am instinctively asking in my in my in my research is is it possible to apply it within a business it's setting uh, within a communication setting all the evidence suggests you know, that it, 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 it is currently being used um but i'm interested in putting a more of a methodological approach because there there's actually surprisingly a lack of evidence out there saying how has humor been used within the um within the uh within the commercial uh information space setting that i can't i've, I've, I've plainly in my literature review over the last year 18 months or so um, I've been searching and there's not a great deal of evidence out there to suggest that humour can be used within this setting. I'm here to be contradicted on that and if anybody wants to contact you and tell them what about this paper, what about that paper, I'd be, I'd be delighted to, but I haven't seen much out there. So that's a perfectly good question in, 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 in short. Uh, and maybe it's something which I can potentially look into after I've got finished my PhD. Uh, maybe a sec, maybe there will be papers in that, I guess. But um, I'm not sure um, how humour, can humour be used in a commercial setting? Um, so that's but fundamentally the nature of what I'm trying to, try to understand. Um, and I guess over the years, we... We, we all kind of have grown up on and, and I guess you know people growing up now on the uh, the marketing and PR textbooks of how you should do your you know your sort of due diligence in you know serving your customers and your audience and things and we, we've kind of I guess grown up on 
what is now probably quite dated theory. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to hear that um, you know you've you've not really found huge amount of evidence or even you know an appetite to study this because to me this would be a topic that you know as soon as we first um, had the conversation about should we go there should we actually talk about this on the podcast I was right. like, I totally want to do this because it feels like it's been such a long time coming. I mean I can remember sort of way way back. I mean this is quite some way back where you know early websites would never even consider in some industries having people on the, on the website as imagery you know i mean they could come back to use the, uh, uh, the the legal sector as an example i mean law firms with websites would always have you know the front of their offices and the grand kind of main entrance to the building you'd never see a lawyer on the website oh no we keep them in the back office whereas now you just wouldn't not expect to see, you know, uh, the, the whole kind of you know, range of partners and senior partners and anybody who's going to be, you know, sort of representing you. You'll see their biographies, you'll see their their photos. So I, I guess we've become much more personal, e even in kind of what, what is termed quite a serious industry, the sort of legal industry. Is is this kind of what you think probably is one of the, the key triggers here? Is that as a as a sort of a humanity, it's not even just as society or communities, probably as humanity, we are really now starting to recognize that actually we're human beings communicating with human beings. I mean, H to H used to be B to B, B to C, business to business, business to consumer. It's now H to H, I'm seeing all over the place, human to human. I mean, it feels like then this becomes more of a thing because if you're allowed then to have a proper relationship and to properly communicate, well, as we would in kind of real life, it is then potentially playful at times. It is kind of getting to know the person. I use always use the phrase professional intimacy with your best customers. I mean, that's kind of ultimately what we're after is an intimate professional relationship. It's almost like you can't do that without humor because you would in a, a natural setting anyway. So do you, do you think it's almost that like this is the time and you're kind of in, in that sort of perfect storm moment? Because it feels like it from where I'm looking. Uh, I, I, well, I was... Who knows? Uh, I would. I instinctively feel. Uh, I agree with everything you say. I think there's. Uh, yeah, it's not like it's. This is not new news, guys. This is like Mr. Aristotle was talking about this two and a half thousand years ago. If you want to communicate with people, you've got to emote with them. You've got to get on with them. Now you can. Uh, you can. You can tell them a hot story. You can make them cry. You can make them laugh. I mean, I had an open day at the university. I was presenting an open day at the university on Saturday. Uh, and I've done these a few times, about half a dozen times or so. And I and I could do the exact same spiel, get it over and done within half an hour, and people would have forgotten about it five minutes later. I know, I know how it works, but I needed to emote. I needed people to kind of, you know, break down those barriers, realize that they're, yeah, they're being sold to fundamentally. Let's not cut away from the fact that we're trying to communicate a, a message of positivism, but how are we going to do that where it's credible, where it's authentic, where it actually tells authenticity, I think it's an element of it. And I think I emoted, I told them a personal story. First 30 minutes or two, I told them a personal story. They, the, the, the audience, they opened or open day, both parents and students. I remember my day, my first few weeks at university, many, many moons ago. I remember that. And I remember how scared I was, how bullied I was, how, uh, how, how, how nervous I was. And yet I had this front of confidence, but it was about, it was paper thin indeed. Um, I remember, so I imagine what these young 17, 18 year olds who are going to university next year, I imagine what they're going through because I've been through it myself. So I felt it was authentic to, to emote that. Um, and I try to use humour. Now, uh, you know, the, the humour has to have a two, as I said, two elements. It has to have a degree of playfulness. You know, doesn't mean you have to turn up with quite a red nose on your nose and, you know, big floppy shoes and, you know, squirt water through a flower. You, you know, it, you're not look, talking to be a, be a clown, but you have, there, has, there has to be an expectation from the audience that there's a degree of playfulness. Now, if you think about that, if you go into a comedy club, you expect to be entertained. So there's a degree already set as you walk through the door, there's a degree of playfulness. 
written down in the contract that you have when you walk through that door of the comedy club. But if you want to communicate on a, on a humorous level, you have to instill in the audience their expectation as a degree of playfulness coming down the pipeline for them. So they, they need to know that. The second element, I, th I believe, until I'm contradicted, uh, is incongruity. There has to be something which surprises, which is not what it is expected. So playfulness and incongruity, which is pretty much consistent with the, re the re theory um, uh, surrounding humour, but we could boil it down every, from what I can see, every uh, humorous interaction has those two expectations, incongruity and playfulness. Without those two ingredients, you don't have humor. Incongruity on its own, that seems a bit odd, it's a bit weird. Liz Truss was incongruous, bizarre, but she was actually being serious, therefore she was not humorous. So that's to, well, unless you've got two elements to play, those two ingredients, you won't have humor. I say that's part of my hum. That's part of my my my, my for hypothesis, if you will, for my PhD. Um, and it's creating that sense of play. I personally think it's more difficult to create this, the sense of hu uh, playfulness to a complete stranger. Uh, you know, if you if I meet you in a shopping line or a, at an open day, you, you, you're going to be a bit nervous. You're going to be. A bit, how do I create within an instant, a sense of playfulness. Well, that's a challenge. I think it's probably creating an incongruous joke after that. Um, that's pretty much the easiest bit. Creating the joke is fine. Creating that sense of play before, or the expectation of play uh, for humor to exist, for humor, for incongruity to take seeds and to create humor, I think is the difficult bit, which I'm, I'm, I'm currently exploring. But fundamentally, um, I think there's, 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 there's something there. And I think because, and I said to you before, Neil, that we get so many messages. I mean, so many, so much information is coming to our eyeballs because of mobile phones and computers. How do you cut through? And I think we need to cut through through human to human. We need to, we need to humanize the effect now. Otherwise, it's, it, it's just going to sound like it's going to be white noise it's just gonna it's not gonna work um and i think you know if you're gonna do something you gotta do it so it works and so it's effective maybe i'm being a little bit my industry background means you've got if you're gonna do something you make sure it works don't do it just for the sake of doing it which is some industries some in some, some sectors just do it so they tick the box do it so it's effective so if something's gonna be effective you've got to how do you make that effect best is humor an answer yes or no maybe yes or no and i think if it is yes then let's explore how that can be that can be um that can that can work feels like there's a there's a sort of a natural brand i guess the word style or tone of voice that if your brand is already kind of high energy a little bit playful in itself that this isn't too far or too many steps to go it feels like you could actually then sort of develop maybe that storytelling because i think what you're describing here feels like it's it's kind of fun high energy no not 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 crazy and completely completely wired but just sort of a high impact high energy level of storytelling that is fun yeah playful fun and if you if your brand's already like that it feels like that's only just maybe one or two steps of kind of attention and focus to make it happen there's plenty of evidence plenty of literature out there which underpins what exactly what you say certain industry sub industry types lend themselves to humor um you wouldn't be surprised to tell you that selling refrigerators t is a bit of a stretch in, in, in using humor, however, selling training shoes or uh, effectively low risk consumer purchases. Um, when I say low risk, I you don't drop 10,000 pounds on them or a thousand pounds, but relatively low risk, say for example, packets of crisps or a Mars bar or something like that. 
anything which is considered low risk, uh, the, the data and the evidence would suggest is, is more open, more susceptible to humor. Selling a car with humor, that's a little bit more, that's a little bit trickier, like the evidence suggests. But then again, ask yourself, if your British Airways, and I say it's a brave move by British Airways, if you're British Airways and you want to cut through, you know your audience uh, is not going to listen to your safety message. You know that. Nobody listens. I mean, give me somebody who actually listens to these safety messages. N nobody does. So if you're a British Airways and you are going to try and cut through with your thousands of customers every day, and you have to make sure that they get this message. And if they don't, and if, they, if they don't get it, people could die. I mean, that's a fairly serious risk if British Airways gets this wrong. So if they don't get this message, if they don't know where the exits are, if they don't know where the life jackets are, if they don't know the process, then they could get it wrong. And that could, you know, they could be opening themselves up to a whole, you know, body of risk in terms of legal uh, legal risk and the environment, uh, safety and health and safety and all the rest. They, they took a, a brave decision to say that we're going to use humor in this in this in this in this uh, messaging effect. Uh, and they've been copied. I think New Zealand Air have used humor. Uh, the look they played on the Lord of the Rings um, because they now realize that they get, they get cut through. Whereas before, in the standard message, people just didn't get it. And so they, they decided to use that. Now, that to me wouldn't seem like a natural home for humor. It wouldn't seem like that. It doesn't seem that you could use humor in a fairly serious, risky environment like a health and safety message. Because if you get that wrong, British Airways are on the hook for some serious risk i think um and so that was that was something how can they get away with that what was it, what was about that scenario and can that be replicated across other brands um and that's something which i'm very very interested to explore as well um but again i'm going to temper this by saying as i said before i instinctively don't think you can sell uh funeral homes by using humor but i could be wrong I don't know. I genuinely, there is evidence out there that people are selling life insurance. Uh, they're selling uh, home insurance through humor. It's really odd. How is that? How is that serious message now being communicated? Very effectively, you should say. The data, the, suggest, the analytics behind it suggest that that's a really effective message. Their sales. The, the metrics after that, this is a, this is a company out in America um, that used humor in their uh, life assurance products, really effective. Um, and I'm fascinated by that and see where it can, where we can humanize the message. I mean, the, your, your, your journey, as you described in the early days of law websites and all the rest, you know, the grand pillars doors of august legal office maybe that's what the officers the people in charge believe that their audiences wanted maybe the audiences wanted to see the real people and get a feel a human feel for the people behind those doors and i think that's been and that's evidence now it's inconceivable in this day and age that you would um be so inhumane as just to put non-people on websites i mean you're always trying to tell about the team because it's human it connects through it can you use humor as well? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand that. Mm. Is it is it back to this word trust? I mean, I, I keep hearing this word at the, at the back of my mind as you're talking because it feels to me like there's a there's a little theme here that's kind of running through all of this. No matter whether you want to try this out, no, no matter whether you know your competitors are doing this, or you think, oh, actually, we could be playful, a little bit more playful in some of our campaigns. It might not be something that is right across the whole brand messaging or every communication we do, but maybe in this little, I don't know, this coming Christmas or something you decide right we're going to do a little christmas campaign is it do you think that the key theme here 
is that you can almost kind of get away with it. I'll use that phrase advisedly, but get away with it if you have already established trust in the minds of your both prospects or existing yeah. customers. Because yeah. it, it feels like that's a theme yeah. that kind of runs through all of this. I think you've hit the nail. That's a really good nail hit, head being hit there. You know, I think fundamentally, how do you develop trust in the eyes of your customers? I mean, if you, uh, if you, you, you generally trust people more if you like them, I think it's, it's common sense, really. Uh, if you like somebody, you're going to tend, it's not a, a big jump to trust them if you like them. Not necessarily if you like them, you do trust them. I don't trust Boris Johnson as far as I could throw him, but I quite like him. I go for a pint with him. Would I leave him alone with my partner for more than five minutes? Not a chance. But it's certainly on the way, certainly the route towards trust is, is to like somebody. And how do you like somebody? And if you can engage with them, if you can emote with them, if you can uh, get on with them, getting on with them, if you can help that with a degree of humor, I think you're on the road towards trust. Um, and I think that's in any commercial engagement setting. If you're going to buy something from somebody, you've got to trust them, full stop. And I think how do you move towards that that point of trust? Being likable, being engaging, being human, being affable. How do you get to that particular stage? Well, is humour, can humour be a play? Now, um, if I was you know, a policeman, that I wouldn't necessarily want a sense of humour out of my policeman, but I'd certainly want a sense of trust. Um, the two don't necessarily, as I say, you, you, gaining trust doesn't necessarily come through sense of humour, but I think it helps in some, in, in a lot of instances. Um, and I'm really keen to explore that. But I think you're absolutely, if you the nail on the head, trust is where you want to be how do you gain how do you get to that um that's that position where you can trust this body this organization this individual um and i think humor can 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 be a uh, an element of that I'm enjoying the way that you're defining this 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 word humor because I think where before we kind of really started doing deeper dives into this in this conversation i I guess I was thinking that humor. In, in the way that I was just, I guess, subconsciously defining it was very much about almost kind of to the point of joke telling or being a comedian with a small C here. And, and that's not really what we're talking about. I think if you if you ask the average person on the street, you know, just literally walk up to them and say, OK, tell me what, what you mean by humour. They'd probably say, well, it is a joke or it's, oh, it's this particular comedian who's my favourite one or whatever. But that isn't actually what we're defining here, is it? This is about intimacy of communication through a lightness of storytelling, really. It's this kind of very different sort of thing, isn't it? I, I agree. And I think storytelling is is, 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 is important. Uh, the, I think it's, I'm also trying to, I'm trying to give a, an analogy to what you've just said there, Neil. It's like, I'm not sure if this is all together. Maybe you can edit this bit out because it might not work. But um, it's like saying, just define to me food. Uh, well, it's such a broad thing. Um, define to me humor. It is jokes and tell it, storytelling is, is an element of that. But it's, it's vast and it's, you know, we're, we're how many people? Seven billion people on the planet. There's probably seven billion people who've got different types of humor. But there are set types of humor which seem to work more effectively. Um, and if you play and if you mine that scene, then you can be, uh, you, you can tell more jokes. To, so you can be more humorous to more people. I think humor uh, is, is not restricted. To just jokes and storytelling, I think it's a an approach which, as I say, fundamentally has a degree of playfulness, in, in, in expectation of playfulness from the position of the audience, um, and also incongruity, which comes down the pipeline. So, 
um, when you say something ironic, it's not what you expect, but it's, 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 I had a really good definition of irony once and I'm going to bugger it up, but basically it's the, um, uh, the, the literal meaning is the op is, is counterpointed by or counter counterpointed by the actual meaning. So that's not, that's unusual. That's not, that's incongruous. And I think, um, a man walking down the street slips up, slips on a banana. That's not what you expect. That's incongruous to what your expectation. That in of itself, that scenario of a man walking down the street slipping on banana would not be humorous if there wasn't an expectation of play. There wasn't ex if you weren't from the audience. It's tragic. It's mean. It's it's quite nasty seeing somebody fall on a banana and hurt themselves. But if it's from the position of a clown, instinctively, instinctively you see the position, there's, there's a guy, he's gonna make me laugh, and he slips. There you go, there's humor. Playfulness combined with incongruity, I think is the fundamental element, not the only elements, obviously, there are many, 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 many more, and there's a whole industry out there who make a lot of, you know, a huge industry of, uh, of, of humor, I'm saying, until I'm contradicted, that the, if for 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 for, hum, for 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 humor to take place, there has to be those two elements, um, and I can't until somebody contradicts me. That's that's where I, I that's my hypothesis. Um, but for the within the commercial setting, coming back to my research, within the commercial setting, I'm interested in to see how that could be best used to an effect for a firm. I think. Um, to, to, to better improve their messaging to their audience. Um, and I'm saying probably in certain cases, I gave the example of funeral directors or funeral homes, uh, pharmacy, they're not, that's not going to happen probably because I don't think there's instinctively a sense of play there. Um, so I don't think necessarily you're going to win or you're going to be able to be affected in terms of humour in those settings because I'm not sure if, if common sense would lend, it, lend itself to a degree of playfulness. Um, I don't think that would work in humour in funeral homes. I don't. It's more the, the, the emotion that comes to me there is more of is, 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 is tragedy. But anyway, we'll, I don't want to jump. Let's, I can go down that rabbit hole. Um, but I think that, to my mind, is, and I think this, that, to my mind, I think is um, uh, where I'm trying to explore. Mm. And with, without, I guess, the alienation that I think a lot of people would either assume could potentially happen, you might, by using humour in whatever guys, you know, you as a, as a particular business decide to do it, I, I guess the fear or the challenge prior to doing that could be, but what happens if we alienate? And I think you kind of used a, a very useful phrase there that, that I'd just like to remind people of when if they're making their decision whether to step forward into this brave new world is, is target audience. Mm -hmm. I think if you know your target audience, as you've just described it there, David, I think then there is probably less of a risk in alienation because you actually know what they're like. You, you've listened to them. You've mm -hmm. been facing to face with them you've kind of talked to them in either a digital sense or a, a real world sense so you kind of know what probably would on average be acceptable to them if you've done a persona profiling exercise you'll know their kind of lifestyle and what they're used to and probably their values and expectations so there is some kind of level of you know sort of safeguarding here isn't there is if you, if you think about the target audience and then you don't go and tell any sort of crass joke or something that you know would be consciously inappropriate i think you can almost sort of yeah sort of future proof yourself here just by yep. maybe just taking those first gentle steps of using the playfulness in congruity and so and just actually just try and play with yeah, kind of a, a safer kind of option, knowing the audience rather than saying, hey, we're going to just suddenly rebrand ourselves this crazy, wacky, humorous, funny, clown-like brand. I mean, that is, isn't clearly going to work. I, I so. would never, for the sake of it, um, 
I would never suggest, I mean, that would be the actions of a very irresponsible marketing manager to decide to, to do that. I think um, you, you need, the purpose is, is to see, to question, could it be used? Question mark. And again, if you say yes to that, then great, then let's explore that. Uh, more in an, in, a, in an evolving manner. You don't want to quite be. You don't want to reinvent something. Again, drawing parallels with Liz Truss and her travails over the last month or so. She tried to basically you know, completely change the way we approach taxation, for example, in this country. I mean, she decided to take money away from the average man in the street, woman in the street, and give it to the rich. It seems feudalistic in its approach, in my opinion. Um, but that was what she believed was going to make Britain a faster growing economy. Fair enough. That was very, very fast, very, very dramatic. I wouldn't suggest that at all. I question knowing your audience. Is humour potentially, to your, using common sense, is it, could it be appropriate? question mark yes no and if the answer is no fine we, we move on down the road but if the answer is potentially yes then let's explore that because humor lends itself to likability likability lends itself to trust trust lends itself to better commercial engagement for your firm and i think it's something which i'm trying to explore it has to, can it, can that be, how can that be, I should say, be better you? Well, actually, two questions. Can it be used in this, in this context within the university student uh, admission setting? Um, and then B, how you can best do that? Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, so it is a journey, and I think it's an important journey. I think it's something which you've just... You've, you've explained a sort of progression in terms of the, uh, of the communication effect through uh, the internet and legal firms. They had a very safe, solid approach, the August, and then they've decided to open that up. Why have they decided to open that up, make, you know, uh, partner profiles? Why have they put pictures of people on their website? because it makes people like them. It makes people trust them. If they can see their face and they can see their, um, their, their hobbies and their interests, people like people that they can gain. But um, it lends itself to likability and it lends itself to it, which in turn lends itself to the journey of gaining trust. And I think that's something which is, you, you said it yourself, which is consistent with um, if you want to cut through, if you want to engage, that's how you have to, you have to emote, you have to get on with people's human side, human to human, as you said. And I'm guessing as well, there are specific channels. If anybody listening to this decides, you know, actually we want to have a little play with this. We want to be playful. We want to start storytelling and just experiment a little bit. I mean, would you advocate maybe ring fencing? I think the technical term is sandboxing, maybe at one particular channel and just exploring it. I mean, the obvious one would be TikTok, for example, create a TikTok channel, mm -hmm. you know, encourage a few of your target audience there. And, and have some fun with maybe a little short kind of humor campaign because then you're not necessarily then impacting on the, it was obviously what you don't want to do is cannibalize all of your business and suddenly it's like, oh, well, they're not a serious business anymore. And then you're gone. Yeah. Well, Ring great. fencing something that's safer probably makes sense, doesn't it, at this early I agree. stage? I mean, TikTok is a classic case. Uh, and I should say having a TikTok um, I re watch TikTok as most people do these days. And the, the things which I are really interested in are those uh, messages which are, you know, probably emotive, but certainly humorous in their nature. That keeps me online far more than, you know, somebody kind of shouting or, and I think that's, that's certainly helped. And I think you the way of managing that risk of your because you can't mess around with the brand 
um, but you can manage it and you can you can trial it out you can sandbox it if you will and see if it works and i think if you can start pushing that boundary um, with a degree of humor and see if it works if it doesn't work fine but as part of the iterative development process yeah i think that's a really good approach is just to use a relatively safe environment uh, like TikTok and just practice with it and see if it works and see if people engage and if you do get it, if you do get engagement through humor um there's you know you, there's all the plus side but there's the risk of if damaging your brand is is minimized so the downside is minimized but the upside uh you're potentially far more attractive so yeah i think that's a great that's a really good approach yeah. Brilliant. I would love if we could call this um, this particular episode part one. Would you come back and share when when the time is right, share your results with us? Because I, I think this would be a lovely follow up if we could do a part two. Um, my PhD ethics uh, sits with um, some very unhumorous people in an office with ethics on their door and they're making sure that I'm not doing anything unethical which will have a de detrimental effect on the university's reputation for doing uh, ethical uh, research i expect that to be pretty much given the okay this week and then from i'll start the process of click, click making the my two messages and then putting them out and hopefully by spring next year i will be in a position to um have some preliminary results. I will be, as I say, presenting them to a conference, uh, the ISHS conference in Boston next year. I'll be giving, and then once you've got your data, it's just a case of testing your data, seeing if your hypotheses stack up, if they don't stack up, and then exploring that. That's, that's some. So yeah, I'll be happy to come back, subject to me having data in uh, uh, springtime next year. Wonderful. I don't want to gazump the uh, the Boston conference, so maybe just after that, because I, well, I, whilst I'd love to steal their thunder and we'll have a sense of humor about it. here yeah. first, but uh, that would be a laugh, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, but, well, I'll say, you know, I, I don't see them having too much of an issue with that. They're quite good nature. They're very funny people, actually. Well, actually, are they? I mean, I went to their conference last year, and some of them were really pointy headed, and they're right, you know, really nerdy. But some of them are quite funny. I didn't laugh a lot, surprisingly, at the conference. Uh, to the, I thought I might do, but I didn't. It was They're clearly nice. trying to build trust with you, aren't they? Clearly, at this stage, <laughs> maybe that comes next year. Maybe, maybe it does. Brilliant. So, Dave McGee, thank you so much for coming along to this episode. Uh, it's been a fascinating little exploration into the first steps. This is part one of Humor in Marketing. Watch out now for part two coming soon in 2023. Okay. Thank you.